Good morning, everyone. I would like to talk about writing debugging modules. My name is Yuri Wiesner, and I work at SUSE Labs. So I'd like to start with a concrete example. In this case, the task at hand is tracing syscalls and determining and measuring syscall duration. Well, this, this result is actually from my own debugging module. We're interested in what the syscall is, in the total time, how many times it was executed, the average time, the root mean square deviation and the maximum values of that. As you'll notice, these read calls actually take much more than the write calls. And the reason for that is that mostly the processes have to con switch context. So the read call actually blocks. And the module measures uh, the time the process spent sleeping Oh. So, uh, I would like to demonstrate the overhead of various tracing solutions. In this case, it's a custom debugging module, and this one has only 11%, slows down your workload by 11%. This specific workload is a SCED pipe benchmark as implemented in Perf. And I'm merely using the median time needed to execute the benchmark as a measure of, of the overhead of, of the solution. So if you thought you'd just record a full trace and be done with it, well, you could. But you'd be paying 59% in overhead, so your workload will be slower, much more. And. Uh, if you record a trace like this, you're using the raw syscalls trace point, sysender, sysexit. You'd actually find out page down. I'm sorry, it's not responding. shouldn't. So you'd actually find out that you had a I.O. overload. Um, that's bad because you lost much of the trace. So you fix memory, allocate some extra memory, be generous with it. And you, your overhead will also increase to 67% because now you're really getting every single syscall. But the workload is much slower. Plus, you've got to analyze the data after you've finished recording. So, you'd think BPF would be a solution in this case, and as far as I found out, it's not really. I used a syscall tracing script that we have in the MM Debug Tools repository, and sadly, it uh, slows down the, the workload much more than the debugging module. I noticed that the code uses two BPF hashes, so I rewrote it to, to use just one. And it did not help. The overhead is still more than 20%. Now, to be fair and put this into, into perspective, 
is that the benchmark itself is a simplistic one. Four bytes are sent back and forth through a Unix pipe. And uh, that means there are as many syscalls and as the CPU can realistically make on the machine where I was testing, it was six, it was, it was hundreds of thousands of syscalls per second. Uh, real life processes and real life workloads do not do this. There are some examples. It's an order of magnitude less, usually iperf3, for example. As you see, it's close to that. So it, it, de it depends on the workload. And so, so the, the slowdown, how much your benchmark or workload will be slower, will, uh, will depend on the number of syscalls. So I've demonstrated the low overhead of debugging modules. I should also emphasize that they provide you with uh, unprecedented observability and control at, at instruction level. Uh, I'd like to emphasize the word control. You can change the behavior of the kernel. No reboot is required <clears throat> to load the module. You do not need to crash the kernel to actually get data. The development time is shorter. Uh, it's easier and faster to compile a module. There are fewer layers <clears throat> between the code you're trying to debug and the probes you're trying to execute on it. I'm looking at you, system tap. Uh, and uh, this, uh, these, you can write a debugging module for pretty much everything, and that includes less 11, where even ftrace isn't as advanced as it is now. Uh, ftrace in, in less 11 is fairly basic. But there are also some disadvantages, and the main one is actually um, the kernel not always works in the way you expect it to work. So you may end up crashing the kernel. So you do not use this in pr on production machines. That's basically when you're trying to make a customer run your module, you have to emphasize that this is not for production machines. There's also a caveat when it comes to K probes and K red probes. They may be missed. This, these are instances of the handlers not executing, and there's a counter to actually uh, indicate that a K probe or K red probe has been missed. So far, I haven't figured out how to use trace points that are found in modules and instrument them from my debugging module. And the other disadvantages are not, not that severe. You need to be aware of how to synchronize data because eventually you will want to keep state in your debugging module. You've got to be aware of execution of, of, of contexts. So you need to know where your probes will be executed. Will it be in process context, in interrupt context, or both? Uh, the answer may be both. In my case, it, it often is. Uh, you might want to know how work queues, work timers. There are many possibilities. Also, the understanding of the CPU calling conventions and uh, the, the basic instruction level machine code is necessary if you want to use k probes effectively. And the last disadvantage is that it um, you may get unexpected crashes that take some time figuring out. So in order to write a debugging module, one needs to be able to write a module. This is a code for a very simple module that just prints two messages into the kernel log. And we've got a module init function and a module exit function. These are registered with these, with these calls. And you need one include and a module license. And this is all the code you need to create a module. 
There's a make file that goes with that. And once you have a make file like this, or a more complicated one, install all the necessary packages. You can use just the well-known make commands to actually compile this. Uh, there is one point you need to take care of our dependencies. You may be loading your debugging module on a testing machine, but does this testing machine have all the symbols on which you place the probes? Because if you're debugging something um, in NFS code, you need to have the NFS module loaded, for example. Oh. So, and then you load the, the debugging module with insmod because you do not implement any dependencies. I, I never did. And unload it with rnmod. So, I usually uh, started uh, the description with k probes and k red probes, but I'd argue that trace points are more important than those. And the reason is trace points do not get missed. Trace points get executed. And also the call stack is much shorter. Well, there's no call stack because uh, the trace point executes your handler right away without any functions in between. So trace points are debugging code that's embedded in the kernel and probes can be attached to these trace points. A trace point can be off when it has got no probes on it, or it can be on. A trace point that is off, uh, there is a penalty, there are two instructions executed, so it's almost not noticeable that the trace point's there. The API, from the API there are several functions I'd like to point out. The for each kernel trace point uh, this function allows you provide a callback for this function and the callback is executed for every kernel trace point that is in the kernel image. It doesn't work for modules. There is a function to synchronize state when you're unloading your debugging module. And then there are the trace point register function functions, there's a whole set of them. But for these to work, you've got to uh, know, have a, have a pointer to the trace point. And uh, most of these pointers or, or these uh, variables aren't exported, so you, can, you cannot access them directly. Hence, the for each kernel trace point function. Uh, Tracing syscalls is a common task, and uh, for that purpose, there's, there are two trace points. You've got the sysenter trace point and the sysexit trace point. Uh, what's important for you is the function prototype that will uh, be inherited by your future probe. And in, in the case of the sysenter, sysenter trace point, it's uh, a pointer to a struct with registers and the syscall ID. For sysexit, you get a pointer to the registers again and the return value of the syscall. So if you're about to uh, carry on with your syscall, is with writing your syscall tracing module, uh, the code I'm showing actually works, compiles, so uh, there, there are no, no hidden parts that are omitted, except for error, error handling in some cases. So, uh, when you're entering the kernel, uh, this is the probe you want to execute. Probe, as you notice, the prototype, you've got the registers and the syscall ID, and you've got a data pointer that's a void, void pointer that you set when, you're, when you are instrumenting the trace point. I do not use this pointer. Uh, in this case, it may have some limited use. Uh, I would like to note that this has been simplified because I'm only filtering 
the process that has got uh, the ID equal to my PID declared here. Uh, otherwise, I'd have to keep state. I usually use a hash for it. So I didn't want to show you the, all, all the code with the hash. So I'm filtering just one PID so I can use global variables. I'm checking the syscall number and if it is a known one, I save the entry time by calling local clock and the syscall ID. Otherwise, I invalidate this, this execution of, of the probe. And I'm doing something special for Futex syscalls because I have got the ID, so I can simply say, if you're executing a Futex, please store the first argument. This is the probe for the return from kernel. As you can also see when you look at the prototype, again, I'm filtering out only my PID. I compute the, the duration that the process spent in the kernel. And if this diff is greater than my specified tolerance, I print the message. And this is already better than any tracing, I mean the, the simple tracing solutions where you capture the whole trace. You've got some filtering in place already. The resulting trace will be uh, smaller and the entries will be more relevant. For few texts, I'm also printing the address of the few text word. Now, how do you hook this to the trace point? You use the for each kernel trace point function. You give it a callback, a probe at T probe in this case, or del probe if you're removing. These are my functions. I wrote these and you give it a, the, the private data, which is the T probes array. And the T probes array is of a type I've declared which is understood by these callbacks. And uh, I'm, I'm specifying the name of the trace point and the name of the handler, and there's no data. And uh, in these callbacks, I'm iterating over all, all uh, over, over the t-probes array, and I'm checking the name of the trace point against the, uh, the array elements. And if these match, I register the probe for this trace point. The same with unregistering. Non-blocking syscalls is, there are situations when you do not care about measuring the time of syscalls that have blocked because you may get a lot of noise. So you solve this by instrumenting the sked switch trace point. Here's the prototype for the trace point. Uh, it, uh, there's a bool preempt, which tells you whether the process, process has been preempted or not. And the pointers to the task structs of the process being scheduled out and the process being scheduled in. What's different is the, that, uh, in this case, is that you, the, the probe, ha, probe is actually much smaller. When the PID matches the PID you are trying to observe, you just invalidate the syscall. And in this way, because the, the, it's, uh, the NR is, is checked in the exit probe. So if you invalidate it, you're discounting uh, the instances when the process actually slept during its syscall. And you've got to amend the t-probes array, as expected, I hope. So now, trace points are fine, but they, there's a limited number of them, and when you need more flexibility, you do get that with k-probes and k-ret probes. These allow you instrumenting almost any kernel routine with the exception of no trace functions. And though they allow, allow you to execute handlers or handler functions. You can collect debugging information and you can change the behavior of the kernel. K-probes are generally placed at the first instruction of a function or 
at any offset you choose, understanding, but uh, provided you've read the, the disassembly of that function. So you're, you know which instruction you are instrumenting. There's a pre-handler and post-handler. K-red probes are a bit different. They focus on function return. So they are registered for a kernel function as a whole. And there's an entry handler that's placed on the first instruction. And the actual handler is executed when the function returns. When you, I, I wanted to also to show the PT regs structure for x86 because this is uh, this is the machine state uh, this is what how the machine look what the machine was doing when your k probe or k red probe has been executed so you may read these values and you may even change these values provided you know what you're doing so k probes in more detail what, I, what I'd like to say, uh, when you create a K-probe, uh, the kernel code is modified. So there is a, a breakpoint instruction is inserted into the place. And when the K-probe, when the breakpoint instruction is executed, uh, the K-probe calls its pre-handler. Then the instruction is single-stepped and the post-handler is called. Um, the API is simple. It's just register k-probe and register k-probes, and you can check for for success. And there is there is a rollback for register k-probes. Uh, removing a k-probe is similar to that. There's just un at the beginning. Uh, the signature of the pre-handler and post-handler are well, as I said, you get the machine state. You get the pointer to the struct with, uh, with the registers and also the, the pointer to the k-probe itself. So you can, for example, print the name of, of the k-probe. Here's the whole structure. You, of course, have the symbol name. You have an offset into the symbol, pre and post handler, the number of the missed counter, as I said, and some other stuff. So about this uh, breakpoint exception is that uh, on x86, this is usually an int3 instruction or an int, or an int instruction with its argument equal to 3. And, uh, well, you, you replace just the first byte and uh, this breakpoint exception actually switches the stack writes the old stack pointer, the rflex register, and the return pointer onto the new stack, and a service routine, an exception handler is executed. Typically, this exception handler stores the values of all the registers, thus creating the uh, pointer to the PT regs structure, as I said before. Upon returning, the IRET instruction is executed, uh, the values are popped off the stack, and a stack switch occurs again. As for k red probes, uh, they are registered for a function as a whole, and each k red probe has an entry handler, which, um, for example, ftrace does not allow you, as, as far as I know, currently does not allow you to, when you use the SysFS, the, the debugfs interface, does not allow you to do anything useful with the entry handler. But in a debugging module, you can use that. You can put your code in there. Uh, KRED probes manipulate the code of the function so that they store the return address, use a trampoline, and execute the k-red probe handler upon returning from the function. So the interface to register a k-red probe is very similar to the k-probe interface. It's simple, it's nice, it works. Oh, here's, an, here's the signature of the k-red probe handler. You may notice you don't get uh, a pointer to the k-red probe, you get something called 
K-red probe instance. So what's that? Uh, the K-red red probe instances are pre-allocated when a K-red probe is created. And uh, they actually allow you to keep state for each execution of the K-probe. There is a limited number of them. Uh, the maximum is max active. And uh, you can put whatever data you like. I usually um, uh, collect d this data in the entry handler and use it in the return handler. So an example for K probes is, uh, it's actually quite easy to measure the time spent in functions using a K-red probe because you get uh, the red probe instance for free. Otherwise, you'd have to keep state for every process or every CPU or in a data structure. But this way, it's much simpler. So you use the interface register K red probe and pass it a point and pass a pointer to the red probe itself. And uh, I've declared it here. Here's the handler. Here's, here's the entry handler and the size of the, the extra size of the red probe instance. And in the entry handler, I'm not doing anything special. I'm just dereferencing and getting a pointer to my data carried in the red probe instance, and I'm storing time. Then in the red probe handler, I compute the diff, how long did it take, if the diff's larger than the tolerance, I print a message and I'm done with it. And the last example is changing the behavior of the kernel. We had a bug in 15SP3 and 15SP2 where uh, systems that accumulated a large a large number of C groups, I mean tens of thousands of memory C groups, tended to get stuck when they were reading the new stat file. The function here actually uh, computes the counters for, uh, for a single memory C group. It uses an, a mask in this four cycle. And then it executes uh, the actual function that iterates over all CPUs. This is the slow part. So you've got many memory C groups and each of them iterates over all CPUs. So if you want to get rid of uh, as much of, of the cycles as you can, the simplest way, uh, and you don't even have to read the disassembly of this function, you just set the LRU mask to zero, and this will be just iterate over all the all the bits, and it uh, it does not there there's not much overhead. So I defined a K probe where I set the third argument, so that would be di si dx. So this is dx. This is the third argument. It's the mask. If you register a K probe like this. Um, well, the new must stat file bug is gone. It's mitigated. Well, not exactly because an another handler is uh, needed. Uh, I need one more function to mitigate the bug, but this is the idea. As for resources, we've got documentation in, right in the Linux source. And also, if you'd like to see some code that I use in real life, not these simplified examples, I recommend this GitLab repository. As for documentation, there, there are ample, <laughs> ample things you can learn about uh, how the machine works. I heartily recommend all of these. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>